so this is for uh, um, a magazine called Katoikos uh, that's issued by the foundation that I work with called the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability. Uh, yeah. And since, uh, you know, India has been much in the news, um, unfortunately for the COVID pandemic, uh, yeah. but also because I think um, the situation has a lot to, to uh, teach us and to make us think um, around issues that our profession works with. Uh, one of them is global governance, as I had mentioned to you. Um, and also one of our objectives is to try to promote uh, a new narrative, a collective narrative of hope around uh, principles like inclusion and social justice. And um, so I think it's relevant in, in that sense also. Um, so, but before we go into the, the COVID crisis, um, I thought it would be useful to ask you to help us understand a little bit uh, the recent context in India, both politically, socially, economically. Um, because I think on the one hand, um, there is a recognition at the international level that the country has progressed uh, in important ways in, in areas like reducing poverty, in improving sanitation. I see that there is an effort to expand health insurance uh, in the country. Um, yet, uh, there is also a lot of concern uh, around uh, perception that there is a growing tendency toward authoritarianism, intolerance toward differences, whether it's religious or ethnic or caste, um, intolerance toward uh, dissent. And I see also that recently a group of civil society leaders have, have uh, protested to the government against what they see as harassment against you for, for criticizing the administration. So um, I wonder if you can give us your views uh, of, of the situation on balance, what the context is in, in your country. Thank you so much, uh, Yuriko. Um, I do believe that, uh, you know, India's uh, Indian Republic, uh, uh, since we got our constitution, it's 71 years, it's probably the most difficult moment uh, for the survival of our Republic. Uh, uh, the, you know, there are many pledges uh, that we made to ourselves uh, during our freedom struggle, led by Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and uh, and in the constitution that uh, we gave to ourselves, uh, that India would be a humane, um, inclusive uh, country, uh, respecting uh, difference of uh, religion, language, culture, offering equal citizenship to people of every faith and belief and culture, uh, but also uh, a, a country which would be uh, uh, just and uh, where freedoms would be protected and uh, there would be equality. And above all, uh, and I think we talk about it least, but uh, you know, as we proceed with the conversation, I think what is most threatened is the idea of fraternity. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the pandemic uh, and, and, and what has happened has exposed all of these fault lines. Uh, very, very, uh, very sharply. Uh, but, you know, a lot of this has got, you know, terribly aggravated with the present uh, leadership and the party in power, which is right wing. It's uh, closely, uh, you know, it's ideological uh, moral lodestar is, uh, is an organization called the RSS. It's the biggest civil society organization probably in the world. Uh, and its leaders have been openly sympathetic with, uh, for instance, Nazi Germany and, uh, and fascist ideologies. Uh, so for, for non-Indians uh, to understand uh, really uh, where India is today, we need to understand that there's a particular battle that goes back actually at least a hundred years. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi had returned from South Africa about a hundred years ago and took leadership of our freedom struggle. 
And uh, as I said, uh, the freedom struggle was not just against British colonialism, but also the imagination of the country that would uh, that we would build after they left. And this idea of equal citizenship uh, to people of every every diverse faith and culture, I think is was crucial for India, but also for the world because. Uh, because I think increasingly we're living in a world where there's a higher and higher chance that your neighbor will not look like you, will not worship like you, will not uh, eat or dress uh, like you. And how do we relate with each other when with difference? And I think that India was civilizationally a country which, uh, which could have offered and tried to offer an, an answer. Uh, so, so the idea of equal citizenship is something, and uh, and the RSS was constituted in 1925, and it it had a very different imagination. Uh, it wanted uh, the Hindu majority uh, that this was a country of, it was almost like Israel, the natural home of Hindus, and uh, especially Muslims and Christians uh, were seen as as people who did not belong equally and uh, and they would be allowed in a sense by the muslim by the hindu majority to live here but with lesser rights as second class citizens and this battle went on through the freedom struggle uh, there was also the muslim league and uh, they also believed that in the muslims of india should have a separate country and uh, Pakistan was constituted, there was a partition, a million people lost their lives, uh, and, and, and so on. So there was a lot of tra trauma, uh, and, and within it, so India was born in, in a moment of great, great anguish and pain. And uh, it, it was, you know, I, I, my gratitude uh, as, you know, as we live through the present times to uh, to somebody like Mahatma Gandhi, because it was very easy to say that now that Pakistan is a Muslim country, India would be a Hindu country. But uh, the resolve that India would belong equally to its Muslim citizens was something that finally led to the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi by people of the same ideology, which is now uh, is triumphalist in a sense. I mean, for the first time, India's all the top constitutional positions in India are held by people who've spent their entire adult lives as members of the uh, RSS. Uh, so, so, uh, and they have a project uh, of almost, I mean, it's quite open hostility and, and hatred against India's Muslims. So that is one part, but I, uh, I also need to acknowledge that uh, the erosion of India's uh, secular identity goes back much older and uh, earlier governments uh, continue to compromise uh, and uh, with this idea of equal citizenship in one way or the other. But the other question of inequality uh, is, is something that I, I wanted to underline where I think there's a much older responsibility. Uh, when we went in for neoliberalism uh, about 30 years ago, uh, India's public health system, I mean, that is something that we see very, you know, the two things that the pandemic has most exposed. One of them is, is, is the public health system. Uh, India spends one of the lowest proportions of GDP, just a little over 1% on public health. Uh, this virtually, I mean, even since my own childhood, I've seen the public health system actually systematically destroyed in favor of for-profit uh, private health care. Uh, and so the middle class has, in a sense, uh, almost seceded from uh, uh, from public health, health and public education and feel that they can buy through health insurance and, and so on. Uh, health, health services which are comparable to the best in the world. And we didn't care about what happened to the poor. And, and, and now when, when we're going through this greatest health emergency uh, of a century, uh, what do we see? 80% of India's doctors uh, actually work uh, for the for-profit private sector, 80%. Uh, so, uh, so we were left with, and so far neoliberal uh, um, thinkers would tell people like us, why are you bothered about the public health system? 
you know, you'll, you'll have health insurance and, you know, we can buy health care we need. But when this crisis has really hit us, we found that even the most generous estimates is that private health care service providers are contributing only to about 10% of the COVID response. And that also at very high, very extortionist uh, rates. So it was left to 20% of the health personnel to actually deal with 90% of the crisis with a completely broken system. And, uh, you know, we keep saying there are no beds. Uh, you know, you can artificially create beds, but where's the health personnel to, to, to deal with them? And, and I think that uh, India's, you know, I've, I've written a lot about this uh, in a book, uh, uh, which I titled Looking Away, uh, Inequality, Prejudice and Indifference in New India. I talked about India's inequality. What troubles me is not just enormous inequalities, uh, but also uh, how comfortable we in the middle class and the rich are with this inequality. Uh, and uh, uh, Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist, you know, he, he talks about, uh, say, if you compare India and China. So many people say India and China are more or less equally unequal. But he said the penalty of inequality is much greater in India. So if I belong to the bottom 10% in China, I will still be able to access some decent education for my child, uh, public health care if my child falls sick. In India, there's no question of accessing any of this. So I think that, uh, but here the present government has only aggravated it, but it is a much older legacy. And I think it's also a civilizational problem with our background of caste, our cultural comfort with inequality. And the only other thing, I've sort of, it's a long answer, but uh, lots of things have got exposed with, with the pandemic, but the other part is, uh, is labor rights. I mean, that we have nine out of 10 workers in India who are in the informal sector. And so when they had a lockdown and we had, you know, we went in overnight for the most, uh, the, the largest lockdown in, in, in the planet and in human history, uh, uh, with 100% of the economy being shut down, all demand, all supply overnight and uh, among the smallest relief packages. So there's so much, there's an explosion of hunger almost overnight and joblessness. The economy is contracting, gone into a deep recession. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I've, again, I've written a lot about this. Uh, it's important to understand that it is not, it was not a badly implemented lockdown. Even in principle, in a country where nine out of 10 workers uh, are informal and therefore, if they don't work even for a day, they're not. They don't have any social security. They're not going to be able to, and uh, to to live. And 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 when when the prime minister tells them stay at home, you have to have a home, keep social distance. Uh, you have to have you know if if you're if you're ten people living in a in a one room slum tenement, uh, hundred people using a, a community toilet. What, what kind of and you don't have drinking water? What kind of social distance? What so even you know the point that I think is important, and I I wrote I've written and I've called I've called the lockdown and the public policies that have been followed a crime against humanity, and it's a very strong uh, because you excluded the poor even from the principle of protection, but they were the ones who are bearing, uh, you know, probably for a generation the burdens of the consequences of those decisions. So uh, so the poor are not protected, and yet hunger and homelessness and uh, hunger and joblessness uh, is going to uh, you know uh, trouble them for for at least a generation uh, so that is really uh, where and uh, uh, sorry so while all of this is happening we also see the authoritarian you know elected autarky uh, at its most exposed uh, uh, you know it's exposed in many ways uh, we see uh, all dissent being crushed. Uh, in, in, you know, myself, for instance, uh, I have uh, police has charged me with you know with unbelievable crimes of insurrection, etc., and, and number of police charge sheets and affidavits to the Supreme Court, etc. I mean, uh, I have only spoken about love and nonviolence, but I've dissented with the state. But uh, and uh, and a number of young people who 
have peacefully protested against changes in the citizenship law which discriminated against India's Muslims uh, as, uh, as, as insurrectionists and terrorists. They're locked up in jail with no chance of bail. Uh, all dissent is, is being criminalized. So, uh, so in many ways, and I could go on, in many ways, India, and I, I worry that the rest of the world is, is not, you know, we talk about uh, Russia, we we'll talk about Hungary, we talk about Turkey, but somehow India is still falling off the radar in terms of uh, international uh, outrage. It, it just happens that we have, uh, you know, a huge market and economy. Uh, we are the global alternative to China. And, uh, and, and I'm afraid that countries which claim to be democratic and to value democratic principles are still turning a, a blind eye uh, to, uh, to the suppression, to the criminalization of dissent and the persecution of minorities and the intense neglect of the poor. Uh, that is, uh, you know, that is playing out in our country. No, well, thank you very much. That's very enlightening. I think you've um, helped us to understand um, well the overall very concerning outlook within the country and what it means also for the for the rest of the world. Uh, because what you're saying about how COVID has highlighted inequalities and injustices and this concerning tendency toward um, authoritarianism, intolerance of differences um, is also, I think, a global trend. And we've seen it in, in countries uh, even like the United States. Um, you mentioned uh, Russia, Turkey, Hungary, so on. and and. And so it's even more important that uh, India can serve as a positive example. And yet, um, as you say, it hasn't been too much in the radar uh, in discussions about these issues. And perhaps, as you say, because it's seen as a counterweight uh, uh, geopolitically to, to, um, uh, to China. China. Yes, yes. Um, the, I, I also wanted to ask you about um, the India exclusion reports that um, your organization, the Center for Equity Studies, publishes annually. Um, and, and I think you've already touched on this a bit, but um, these reports, um, I think, tell us that the threat to democracy and human rights comes not only from overt political repression or violence against uh, dissenters, but it also comes in the form of excluding people, whether by commission or omission from access to essential public goods like education, health, housing, decent work. Um, could you tell us about some of the main findings of the report? Um, the, who are those excluded? What are the mechanisms of exclusion? Um, including um, how you see the concept of public good, because I thought that part was very interesting and important um, in, in explaining um, yeah, how you see exclusion and why it's, why it's important. Yeah, thank you, Yurka. Uh, we started off with an idea of public goods, as, as, as you, as you uh, mentioned, uh, defined very differently from the way economists define it. It's much more close to how political uh, philosopher, in political philosophy it is understood. So we're looking at it as good services, capabilities, uh, functionings uh, uh, that are essential uh, for any human being to live a life of dignity. Uh, so, uh, so that is one, uh, you know, uh, you know, one starting point. We're talking about uh, the duty of the the role of the state, and I think that's really important in a democracy, because it's 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 it's, it's possible and it's correct as well. Uh, to explain a lot of the exclusions in the context of social exclusions. Uh, you know, uh, this is due to a background of caste uh, and India has, uh, has the oldest tradition actually of uninterrupted, uh, religiously sanctioned inequality uh, through caste, uh, for instance, and gender 
and so on. So, uh, so we can and 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 uh, the discrimination against religious minorities. Uh, but to me, that's a and and we can also talk about market exclusions, uh, exclusions because people. So, uh, a, a lot of analysis I think stops short there uh, by saying uh, they excluded due to social or market exclusions. But my point and our point in in, in you know our, our central assumption in in the India exclusion reports is that. The duty of a democratic state is to address and correct uh, social and market exclusions to ensure equitable access of all persons to a range of public goods. Uh, and, and I think th uh, that's the beginning point actually of an alternative imagination uh, of, 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 of the world beyond. Uh, and it's become very critical when we think of the world we will rebuild uh, together, I hope. Uh, after the pandemic uh, passes, uh, and and uh, and inequality uh, in neoliberal times is is so uh, so widely and almost globally uh, because of the influence of uh, IMF, the World Bank, and, and a certain way of thinking that inequality is seen as an acceptable cost uh, because in the end everyone will benefit, and so. In um, one of the exclusion reports, in fact, right I, since I edit them, I in the introduction, we had 25 years of neoliberalism in India, and I said that, you know, it's a time, it's time to assess and and what were the assumptions? Uh, why did what was the argument that everybody would be better off, including the poor, through neoliberal reforms? And there were three assumptions. One was that it would create enormous amounts of wealth. And I think that assumption has been well, uh, you know, uh, has been justified, although very unequal creation of wealth. But in, in, in India had has uh, probably the third largest population of lawless billionaires now, and and uh, uh, but uh, just as a uh, as a caveat, we also have every third uh, child in India is malnourished even today. And every third man nourished child in the world is Indian. So all of that happening together. But that first creation of wealth did happen. The second uh, promise of neoliberalism uh, to me was that how do you how does it matter if the super rich get super 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 rich? Uh, what neoliberalism will ensure is uh, is the creation of decent work opportunities for very large populations, and therefore everybody uh, will be well off. And uh, so, what if the state doesn't provide health and education? Uh, you will have, uh, you'll, you know, through decent work opportunities, you'll have the money to buy uh, uh, from the market uh, the health and education and housing and so on that you need. That I think is has spectacularly failed. Uh, India, uh, in in a number of our exclusion reports, we've actually tracked how we've had almost jobless growth, e even in. Uh, you know, India in, in its high noon of very high economic growth, there was virtually no net job creation. But uh, but also that we found that 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 still hides even more that that the net figure hides the fact that former decent work opportunities have actually consistently declined through the years of neoliberalism, and so even uh, the jobs that are created are now largely unprotected informal. Uh, uh, low paid work. And I, I think that that uh, failure of neoliberalism has to be acknowledged and addressed. And the third uh, finding is that the third justification was that, you know, uh, the, the state uh, empower an empowered state in an economy leads to rent seeking and corruption. And, uh, and therefore, what neoliberalism will do by uh, dismantling state regulations is to uh, reduce uh, uh, corruption and rent seeking. And what we've seen instead is spectacular growth in, in, uh, in, in what can only be described as crony capitalism. And we've seen it in India, you know, in a terrifying way, even with regard to vaccines, to medical oxygen, uh, to the availability of drugs, uh, through all of this, uh, 
the state seems much more interested in protecting private profit of the richest and the super rich rather than uh, the public good. And, and so I think that that's one thing that, that uh, our reports have, have really indicated and there have been six, seven reports annually. I hope we'll be able to, with very limited resources, continue this documentation. But the other part is that, you know, it's very interesting that the ex people who are excluded uh, from, we, you know, one, one question we asked that this is a public good. And we even looked at justice as a public good, for instance, uh, the right to dissent as a public good, as much as we're looking at health and education and clean water and sanitation and, and, and so on, housing. Uh, the groups that are consistently excluded from all of these are almost always the same. They're the former un untouchable caste, uh, caste called the uh, scheduled tribes, uh, scheduled castes in our constitution, uh, tribal people, indigenous people called the scheduled tribes, Muslims, women, and persons with disabilities. I think, you know, across almost every public good, we find the same groups excluded. And therefore, you know, the layering of exclusions on these groups uh, is, is something that we need to uh, uh, pay attention to. And, and that's what we've tried to do. Uh, uh, we have very limited resources. The government ensures that we get very little funding of any kind. Uh, but uh, India's best scholars, uh, activists, uh, etc., and from around the world, uh, have accepted invitations to contribute. And, and therefore, we have a very solid uh, portrayal. Uh, and one last thing about the exclusion report is that reports is that uh, I've always felt that when we talk about the big picture, uh, often in statistics, you know, the poor experience of the poor is reduced to uh, them adding to statistics. Uh, being seen as problems to be solved, uh, statistics to be gathered, and so on. Uh, and it, the, the human experience of exclusion and what it does. So one part of our report is about communities themselves, you know, very micro communities which su suffer. So one part is about public goods, what part is about excluded communities and, 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 and a sort of ethnographic portrayal of their, their lives. Uh, to remind us what it means to be uh, excluded uh, in many ways. So, yeah, so that's what the reports try to do. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I did find it um, uh, really interesting that in your reports, uh, those two things that you mentioned, the, the clear uh, and I guess I would say generous uh, uh, definition of public goods and, and based on the idea of, of, of equal dignity uh, for all people uh, and the idea of the duty of the state to correct those exclusions. Uh, and because I think in, in many of the uh, global reports and particularly the, the UN reports, uh, I think that those two aspects are either missing or not as clearly articulated as, as in your reports, I guess, because it is seen to be sensitive with, with the member states. So um, um, I, I think that it, it would be interesting to, to, for these reports to be um, more yeah, um, read and known globally as well, because as, as the, the way it focuses the issues, I think is, is very, um, is very valuable. Thank you so much. Yeah. In fact, it was an ambition of ours that, that we use the same framework and structure in other countries as well. Uh -huh. uh, and I hope that happens at some stage. Uh, right. Mm. Um, so the, the COVID pandemic arrives uh, in India in this context of already very stark um, inequalities and exclusions. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, how the pandemic affected that context and how the existing exclusions uh, have been manifested uh, in the impact of the pandemic in, in India? Yeah. Uh 
a, 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 a dear friend and a very fine writer and intellectual uh, from India, Arundhati Roy, mm -hmm. uh, said something which I, I found, you know, she has, she's able to express and capture um, truths uh, in a very sharp way. Uh, she said, uh, COVID-19 is a virus we all know, but it is also an X-ray. It's an X-ray of society, uh, which reveals to us what we are as a society. And I think that, uh, you know, it's very powerful to think of it in this way. Um, I, I, I was on the streets almost from the second or third day after uh, the, the nationwide lockdown was announced overnight, actually, with four hours notice uh, by our prime minister, because I work with homeless people. And I, I just could imagine, you know, I, I mean, I could imagine uh, the level of distress it would throw them into uh, almost immediately. And some of my colleagues and I, so for several months, we were trying to organize uh, you know, sort of what we called solidarity relief, because it was in charity. Uh, uh, and people contributed from around the world. But what I saw happening to their lives uh, led me to also uh, write, uh, uh, and, and I, I wrote a book called Locking Down the Poor, uh, 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 The Pandemic and India's Moral Center. And I really talked about how uh, the pandemic has revealed how much our moral center has collapsed. And uh, I, I could just, you know, there, there's, there's a great deal. And of course, we're going through the second phase and the horror of what we're seeing on a daily basis. Uh, I did not imagine that we would see this through our lifetimes. I mean, every day uh, we are losing friends, comrades, uh, loved ones um, very close to us. Uh, our doctor who was leading uh, the work with the homeless uh, died because he couldn't get a bed with oxygen for himself uh, and, and so on. Um, uh, let me just sort of highlight a few things. Uh, I also mentioned them earlier, but when the Prime Minister announced, uh, you know, in a shock in his, he loves this very dramatic kind of uh, announcements and he, uh, when he announced the lockdown, he was saying to the nation, I need you to do just a few things, stay indoors, uh, work from home, uh, keep social distance, wash your hands regularly. And while he was speaking, I was just saying that, you know, he's the prime minister of our country. Has he forgotten? I mean, how could he, how could he forget that nine out of 10 workers, if they stay at home and if they don't work, they're not going to be able to eat the next day, uh, you know, uh, only uh, just about 1%, uh, 1 out of 10 people are in the formal sector and would still get their salaries, have savings, uh, which would keep them through. How could he forget that, that we have homeless people in hundred thousands in, in all our major cities? But uh, even more than that, I mean, uh, the large majority of populations in the cities live in shanties uh, where uh, you know, where social distance is impossible. Uh, and you can wash your hands regularly if you have running water, for instance, and they have to spend about a third or a quarter of their earnings to buy water, even in good times, uh, let alone, you know, in times like this. So, so in a sense, uh, in the imagination of the lockdown, uh, the poor were excluded, uh, even, you know, at its best. Uh, and then it was imposed with great cruelty, with a very small relief package. Uh, we, I went to the Supreme Court with a few colleagues uh, demanding that uh, free rations and at least the equivalent of minimum wages should be paid to every household. Uh, just to be fair in comparison with the middle class who were also getting uh, salaries. Uh, and... Uh, we calculated, and some of the country's best economists were with me. I, we also wrote op opinion pieces. It would have cost India just about 3% of GDP uh, to do this. And uh, it would have, you know, uh, mitigated a great deal of the distress that, that the country saw. 
And ironically, we've gone into a deep recession. It would have also kept demand alive. I mean, mm -hmm. see, you suddenly, overnight, in, an, in the entire country, you shut down all demand and all supply. Yeah. You know, it, it's just mindless. Uh, and uh, here you would have kept alive some demand in local markets, which, are, which would have kept the economy uh, functioning. I, I've always believed that compassionate public policy is also, uh, you know, from a much more utilitarian point of view, sensible economic policy. Uh, and uh, the failure of public compassion in, in how they responded. Then, of course, how do you remedy uh, a completely broken public health system where and a system in which 80% people work for the for-profit sector? Uh, who are trained doctors. Uh, I think the only recourse would have been what Spain did uh, and, and a few other countries would, would be to nationalize at least for the period of the emergency mm -hmm. uh, private health care. Uh, otherwise, you simply could not create, uh, the, the Prime Minister announced we've created 100,000 new COVID beds. He was, as often he is, economical with the truth because they didn't create new COVID beds. What they did was they pulled away beds from all other problems, uh, you know. Uh, so, mm -hmm. TB, maternal child health, even cancer. I mean, in in Mumbai, we actually had uh, patients with cancer being pulled out of hospitals and sleeping under on mats, uh, under over bridges, uh, as as a way of creating COVID beds. So, uh, you, you I mean, you can physically create a bed, but unless you have health personnel who are trained. Mm -hmm. And, that, and if they're all in the private sector, how are you going to respond? So I, I think that, and of course, labor protections, et cetera. So I, my, my fear is that in, in how the government is responding, at least I believe that you know, in, in a tokenistic way, they would increase allocations in the next budget to public health significantly, which they did not. Uh, I, would, I believe that they would at least now acknowledge the need for some social security for, for labor. But they actually, what they did was to pass ordinances which re removed even the labor protections that existed, uh, the few labor protections that existed, for instance, an eight hour day, uh, uh, a work day, et cetera. So, uh, so I have a feeling that uh, far, I mean, the, the X-ray that the pandemic has, has shown us uh, has not stirred the conscience of the nation uh, and, and, and especially people of privilege uh, to demand a more egalitarian society. Uh, the, out, you know, the, the global outcry, I mean, we, we've now, India has made it to uh, top headlines around the world uh, in the second phase. But that is largely because middle class people are also mm -hmm. not able to find beds and are dying, gasping for oxygen outside uh, hospitals. Uh, you know, they're not even able to find a place to cremate or bury their dead. And, and that anguish has, has flowed uh, and, and revealed itself to the world. But uh, what is happening to the poor is not even, you know, what is happening in, in rural India, for instance, is, is a horror that is not even being captured. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, one reads history and, you know, we, we saw uh, India lost the largest number of people in the world in the Spanish flu uh, about 100 mm. years ago. And before that, there were plague epidemics, cholera epidemics. Each time people pointed out what needed to be done, uh, you know, in building uh, to prepare and prevent this kind of catastrophe, uh, which is largely more egalitarian and humane public policy. And each time we've forgotten. And I think that those of us who, who, you know, in whatever lifetimes we have, we should not allow people to forget. Uh, and we should not go back to deepening the same inequalities uh, that, uh, that led to the catastrophe. I mean, there's nothing, it's nothing short, less than a, a catastrophe. I mean, we're losing, we, you know, officially uh, we've crossed 300,000 uh, deaths. Um, but uh, everybody, you know, every uh, expert is saying that it's, it's an undercounting by at least five to 10 times. And if you're seeing that number of people, they're not even place to cremate. People are, are, are casting away their loved ones into the river. Uh, the bodies are rotting. Dogs and vultures are eating the bodies. 
uh, this is the 21st century this is not this is not how uh, how you know when we talk about equitable access to public goods uh, a life and, and a death of dignity i think uh, are so fundamental to uh, uh, to that responsibility and the states have failed us i mean they have abandoned the poor Uh, the the demand you made to the Supreme Court for minimum wage um, has that prospered or what happens to it? See, see, see the first time round last year, uh, the Supreme Court was not willing to pass orders at all. They basically asked for universal distribution of free rations, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the payment of minimum wages to all. And uh, amazingly, it was not costing more than 3% of GDP. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, the actual transfers to the poor have not been more than about 1% of GDP uh, that the government has actually done. And even the, you know, market economies have, have done far more. And uh, uh, so the Supreme Court did not give us any relief uh, last year. This year, I think the horror of what is unfolding uh, is uh, is more visible, Is has stirred the Supreme Court. So we've got one set of orders, which is about distributing, uh, you know, uh, subsidized rations and free rations uh, to a much larger segment of people, at least uh, 80 million people. It, it's not enough, nearly, nearly enough uh, for a country of uh, of, of our size, but uh, at least it, it reflects some acknowledgement of the suffering. Uh, but I think that uh, 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 the recognition of the fundamental right to life and what it entails, uh, uh, there's still a long way to go. And I think uh, both national and international jurisprudence needs to uh, reflect upon what the fundamental right to life means and what duties it entails. I have been talking for a long time about uh, recognizing you know, a new social contract, in a sense, uh, which acknowledges a floor of human dignity below which no one will be allowed to fall. So no child should, you know, her body and brain should not be able to be formed because she cannot uh, get enough nutrition. Uh, no child should die because they can't uh, um, get get a place in a hospital. No old person should have to work for you know her la a last day because she has no uh, pension and social security. A few things like this, and we've calculated you know what we could call universal social rights as costing about ten percent of the GDP. Uh, it's eminently possible. People might ask, where is the money going to come from? We we need to tax the super rich. Uh, it's something that Thomas Piketty and a lot of people are talking about have a wealth tax, have an inheritance tax. Uh, we, you know, I think that, that this floor of human dignity uh, uh, should be nationally and globally uh, a consensus, uh, as along with the question of difference that, that you, know, uh, you know, in a lot of European countries, there's still a homogenizing idea, you know, I can be, uh, French, if I know French, I, uh, I follow what is seen as French culture. So uh, somebody uh, is shy about exposing her body while bathing uh, in, in the sea, so she wears a burkina and that is considered uh, outrageous. Uh, that has to change. I mean, uh, my own wife uh, would, uh, would actually feel shy to uh, wear a swimming suit and uh, that doesn't sort of, uh, that doesn't impose on her the duty to, uh, you know, to change what she feels comfortable with, uh, but rather to have a country that accommodates and respects diverse ways of engaging uh, with, uh, with faith, with, uh, with dress, also sexuality, uh, you know, who you choose to love. Uh, all of these questions need to be uh, that the acceptance of diversity and uh, this floor of human dignity, I think these are two things that I hope in our lifetimes we are able to persuade um, people and governments around the world to, uh, 
and of course, if one has to go a little further, the, the respecting of the right to dissent. Yeah. Right. You 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 go on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Oh right, right. Yeah, the the right to dissent I see is also being eroded uh, globally. Um, yeah. uh, the, the I think the latest report from. Freedom House in, in the US points that out that um, it's something like the greatest regression mm -hmm. globally uh, in, in some time. And I think India was, was um, highlighted in that. So that's, yeah, that's very discouraging. Um, and it seems to be happening um, around the world in different parts. Um, Oh, I, I also wanted to ask you about the, the private health system in, in India, where you say the 80%... Just, just before that, yes. before that sorry, on, the, on the right to dissent, I just wanted yes. to add that, uh, firstly, India has this beautiful tradition of, of our freedom struggle, uh, you know, to have uh, uh, such, a, such an you know, enormous country fighting against colonialism with a promise of, uh, of, of non-violence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the idea that uh, you have, in fact, uh, Mahatma Gandhi used to say that you not only have the right, but the duty to not cooperate with unjust laws and mm -hmm. to do what is called civil disobedience and to accept and demand punishment, but never raise your hand, never hate. And it is in these traditions that many of us are trying to struggle against, uh, uh, yeah, you know. So our, our dissent is is avowedly nonviolent, and uh, and built around an alternative discourse of, of of love and fraternity. And I find that that threatens the present government even more than violent uh, 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 disagreements would. And and that is why people like us. Uh, are being charged as being insurrectionists and terrorists and, and so on and so forth. Um, this criminalizing of all dissent, I was just thinking that uh, the US has many problems, but even under Trump, uh, suppose the, the Black Lives Matter, George Floyd movement, if the people who had led the movement were then charged as being uh, insurrectionists and, uh, you know, and uh, terrorists, uh, what would have happened? And, and it, that is what we are seeing happening in India. Actually, mm -hmm. every voice of dissent is being criminalized. Journalists who are, you know, there was a journalist who was, uh, who simply, uh, Dalit, uh, former untouchable, young teenage girl was gang raped and killed. Uh, and uh, he came to report it. And he has been in prison for the last nine years, uh, nine months, in extremely cruel circumstances. Uh, saying that he was trying to instigate a caste war by reporting this story. So, uh, so we, and, and there are many such examples. We, some of our most respected intellectuals are in prison, in COVID times, falling sick, uh, uh, not even being given elementary protections. Uh, so, uh, so I think that the protection of the, the right to dissent uh, is very, very critical, especially the peaceful right to dissent. I mean, we may still have, you know, if you have a Maoist uh, insurrection, what should be the role of the state? I, I, I mean, we would have positions on that. But certainly in India, with its wonderful tradition of nonviolent resistance against the greatest colonial power in the world, uh, should have uh, spaces for using those same principles um, to dissent against your state. So I just wanted to add that, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, you, you on, on the health system, uh, you mentioned that 80% of the health personnel is working in the private sector uh, and how this second phase of the pandemic is calling so much global attention because not only poor people, but middle-class people are being affected. Um, does that mean that now the private health uh, providers are also uh, involved in attending to, to COVID patients or are they still maintaining themselves at a distance? 
so tragically uh, tragically uh, i mean whatever services the private sector is providing including now vaccinations they doing at a very high cost so the government so we are about the only country in the world uh, where people will have to pay for their vaccinations and what this literally means and and uh, the private sector is almost free to fix its prices mm. so uh, so the reasonable price apparently of a vaccination is about 250 rupees um, we are having private hospitals now which are charging 1800 rupees uh, uh, for a vaccination uh, which also means that uh, it allows rich people to uh, uh, to break the line actually and to get vaccinated uh, and uh, so uh, so i think that and and the cost of hospital beds um, all of this is is shocking in the, in this time uh, but the other face of this the same coin is that uh, you know and i've documented this in my book uh, almost every chief minister of of the state union ministers each of them when they have got covid have chosen to check themselves into private hospitals and for for public servants at the highest level to not have faith in the public system that they are responsible for is 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 is, is to my mind a spectacular um, uh, you know application of every kind of moral responsibility if you can't uh, you trust your own life uh, to that public hospital then you have no business to to be in a position of public authority uh, and 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 so uh, so what we are finding is is even now uh, uh, the public healthcare system i mean i i i have not found examples of for profit large public hospitals actually giving services to the poor at uh, you know at uh, cost price or whatever uh, it, it it's still serving india's very large uh, uh, numerous rich and middle class uh, who are somehow feeling protected and and happy that they can go into these places uh, when i got covid and i had to go to hospital uh, as a reaction to what our ministers were doing i chose to go into a public hospital and i also chose to uh, not go into a private ward but to go to into a general ward mm-hmm. and it was a decision you know it's, it's a long talk which almost killed me uh, the conditions there were so appalling which i sort of experienced uh, and so i think that uh, we if we don't correct uh, there's no there's no sign that we are correcting ourselves yet Uh, i think that the middle class and the rich are still under the opinion under the the illusion that uh, that as as the government has always done it will protect them mm-hmm. and if they throw the poor under the bus how do we how do we care uh, at least you know scientifically the pandemic will keep you in danger unless that last person is also protected against the pandemic even for a purely Uh, selfish utilitarian point of view uh, they must seek egalitarian uh, health policies uh, uh, you know, vaccination for instance but we don't seem to be learning that lesson and i think that's uh, that's what troubles me so hugely yeah that's that is very distressing and um i even see it here in costa rica where um it it has a, a very solid uh public health system run by a public institution that has reached practically universal coverage and and it's really worked heroically to to attend to this pandemic but now it is close to collapse uh mm-hmm. there are there's been a huge surge in cases and partly because uh people have decided not to care anymore and not to follow um even those who are in a position to do so the social distancing the uh not having get togethers uh and are somehow in denial even though the government has been imploring uh the population to to not do that and and the health system authorities have been begging people to 
to to stay home and so on and they're saying that you know we, we cannot take care of the people anymore so so this um sort of yeah callousness faced with such uh tragedy is is um obviously india is on another scale but i think it's something that we're seeing uh, yeah. elsewhere as well and it makes you wonder why why that is but you recall, in, in, in India, again, uh, the scale is, um, in the, the, the context, you need to understand. Uh, it's not just that people are careless, and that's what now the government is saying, that you know people themselves were responsible, they lowered their guard. But the truth is that the government went ahead with uh, elections, with large election rallies, uh, led from the front by the prime minister, with no masking, with no social distance. Uh, you know, and in complete... Uh, you know, it was completely, uh, you know, uh, reckless uh, with, mm-hmm. with human life. Uh, we also had uh, the, what is called the Kum Mela. It's the largest religious gathering in the world. And uh, the irony is that it actually was, you know, advanced by a year. Uh, mm-hmm. It was actually scheduled next year. And they had it this year. And, uh, you know, millions of people gathered in close proximity. And then we had these massive uh, political gatherings, uh, all sanctioned by the leadership, because this was also a Hindu gathering. And then, you know, how can you, you know, uh, how can you expect ordinary people to, uh, to, uh, I mean, they'll follow that same lesson. And uh, I think the the Kummela gathering and, and so on are going to, it's not going to go away for a long time. Because those people are now then spreading out to every corner of the country, into the villages, into and and and, and so on. So uh, so the irresponsibility in India again uh, of 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 self care and protection and distancing and masking was also abandoned uh, by the the top leadership, and and so that's what again makes India an even more grave story. Yeah, no, the, I, I um, read about that also. Um, I think that too, though, perhaps not on a scale of India, has also happened in many countries, particularly developing countries where, um, well, if I take the example of Costa Rica again, um, the, the health system, uh, thankfully, uh, it, it's been, I think, a policy, a long-standing policy of the Costa Rican state to build this solid universal health system that they've continued to invest in. So it's held up so far, uh, but uh, at one point, I think the government decided that they could no longer afford to uh, restrict economic activity. So they opened things up, I think, too early uh, and um, they've, well, only recently they brought back some restrictions, but um, they never went into complete lockdown. And, um, and their discourse is, well, you know, we're, we're, we're all in this together uh, and government people must work together. We're going to work to keep the economy open, but it's your responsibility, people of Costa Rica, to... To, to follow the health protocols. But as you said, um, when people see that everything is being opened up and there are no restrictions being placed, it's a very mixed message. You know, uh, On the one hand, you're being berated for being irresponsible, but uh, the government is saying, well, go out and, and shop and go to restaurants and do tourism. And, and, and I think there is a real, uh, especially in the developing countries, a real dilemma of, well, you know that you need to restrict things, but you can no longer afford to do so because the economy is collapsing and you don't have the money anymore to, to uh, hand out relief uh, money to people who, who um, have to stay home. So. Um, I think uh, in that sense also the, the pandemic has brought out uh, inequalities between countries where there are countries that can afford to, to, to do that and others who that simply can't. So, and vaccination as well has shown global inequalities yes, in, yes. Uh, very dramatically. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned that um, even though the pandemic has highlighted uh, these tremendous exclusions and injustices, that you don't think that this is leading to a change in, in, in uh, outlook or in policies in India. Um, uh, so that's discouraging. Um, you don't think that this has raised awareness in some quarters to demand a change? Um, no, uh, we've had wonderful individual examples of care. Uh, and I think that's, that's what, you know, and solidarity and fraternity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we have people risking their lives, helping people with funerals, cremations, uh, you know, oxygen supply, uh, and, 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 and a number of other services of care. Uh, that still gives me hope. But uh, in terms of, of the state, uh, the state has shown almost no remorse, let alone anything else, uh, let alone introspection, uh, very fundamental introspection. Um, I've also written uh, that it is that the privileged middle classes uh, and the rich who have chosen these governments. I mean, uh, we might point a finger at the government, but these are elected governments uh, supported and uh, enthusiastically uh, by people of privilege. Uh, because we felt that we were being protected uh, and, and uh, advanced and we didn't care what happened to the poor. And I think that that hasn't changed fundamentally uh, yet. Uh, mm -hmm. That realization that I have a stake, even at a personal level. Uh, you know, I might be able to go afford a private hospital, but uh, I have a stake in ensuring that uh, every poor person. I mean, most of our cities don't even have a primary health care system. I was asked by the last government to chair a committee looking at health services for the urban poor. And I was amazed at the fact that there's absolutely no primary health care system at all in most of urban India. Uh, if that existed, there would have been, you know, that would have been the first line of defense in COVID uh, uh, today. So uh, we have to build right you know, from, from, from the base upwards. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've been saying this a lot, unless we learn uh, the, uh, the ultimate lesson of, of fraternity, uh, even more than the other you know, pillars of the, uh, uh, of, of the constitution, justice, liberty, equality, all these are critical, but fraternity, the idea that if there is suffering, pain, loss, injustice to any of my country, uh, women and men and children, it is, uh, you know, injustice and suffering that I will also share as my own. I think it is, that is the ultimate idea of fraternity, uh, that we are bound to and with each other. And, and to my mind, uh, this, is going to, this has to be a societal change. Uh, before it can be a political change. Uh, I, you know, uh, one of my speeches for which uh, I'm being charged for hate mongering and, uh, and insurrection uh, was that ultimately uh, the battle that we are fighting today is about what kind of country we will leave uh, for our children. And every second Indian is actually below the age of 25. We're the youngest country in the world. I, and I was saying to young people, a very large gathering of young people, uh, that ultimately you have to decide what kind of country you want to grow up in and what country you want to leave to your children. Because uh, our generation has clearly made a huge mess. Um, you know, do you want the humane and egalitarian inclusive country that was promised uh, in our freedom struggle and constitution? Or do you want this hier hierarchical, uh, fear-filled, unequal uh, citizenship-based country uh, that belongs to some and doesn't belong to others. Is, is, that, uh, is that something that you want, is, is a choice that we'll have to make? And I said that in the end, this is you know, not really going to be resolved even in parliament. It's not going to be resolved in the courts. It will be resolved by we, the people of India, who gave ourselves a constitution. Uh, as we fight on the streets non-violently, but most of all, it's going to be resolved in, in a fourth place. And, and that's really critical. It's going to be that fourth place is your heart and mind. Uh, 
you know, have we allowed hate, hate and the acceptance of the legitimacy of inequality uh, to colonize our hearts? Or have we cast that away and believe in, in true fraternity and equality? I think that it is ordinary people who will make this choice over this coming generation, not just in India, but around the world. Um, this speaks to uh, what I had mentioned about uh, our foundation's um, objective to try to promote uh, another kind of collective uh, yes. narrative or, or imagination, as, as you said also, uh, one that's more um, yeah, fraternal, uh, of more solidarity, of more compassion. Um, how do you see the young people in India responding, uh, for example, to that speech that you gave? Yeah. Uh, actually, that speech was uh, given large in a university which has a very large population of Muslim students. Mm -hmm. uh, and the police had the night before, because of their protest in the changes in citizenship law, uh, had gone into the library and beaten very badly students who were studying in the library. And there was huge anguish and uh, thousands of students had gathered and I got frantic calls saying, I must come and speak. And that's when I made this speech. Uh, and uh, for which I have you know, been charged you know, in, in multiple ways. Uh, uh, but uh, I found, you know, there's a large segment of young people who are clearly uh, responding uh, and recognizing uh, and I see that uh, recognizing the need for a more humane and equal country. But uh, to be truthful and candid, uh, this generation, the millennial generation, uh, if you'd like, has really grown up in an India very different from the one that I grew up in. I was born uh, seven years after independence, but uh, there was still idealism and hope of, of, of what, you know, what the freedom struggle was about its values, although it had begun eroding, of course. But I never heard in my family, in my school, any word of bigotry, uh, for mm. instance. Uh, and my grandchild, who is about three years old, is going to hear, is hearing, as soon as he makes sense of the world, uh, he's going to hear bigotry everywhere. Mm. Uh, he's in his extended family, on social media, uh, on, on, on television and films. So it is a very different world. The, the, you know, what I call the popular common sense has changed enormously. Mm. Uh, we were raised to be thrifty, uh, to be kind, to be responsible. We are raising our children to be consumerist, uh, to be self-seeking, uh, to feel completely irresponsible to what is happening around, I mean, in, in the neoliberal uh, sort of ethos. But I think that there are enough young people who are uh, who, who are questioning this. Although the popularity of the present government is because a large segment of, of young people are, are voting this government and it's, I, I, you know, with its ideology uh, in. Uh, so I, 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 I'm a person whose politics is based on an almost naive sense of optimism and hope. And uh, as Martin Luther King once said that the arc of history is long, uh, but in the end, it will bend towards justice. And I, it has to be, otherwise this century. And what I'm talking about India applies, I think, in different ways to almost every country in the world. The people of these countries will have to decide how they deal with, I think, three principal challenges, how they'll deal with difference, how they'll deal with inequality, and something that I haven't spoken about, how they'll deal with climate change. Yes. And I think all of these decisions, uh, the more I think about them, if, if we claim or reclaim the idea of, of fraternity, we'll find solutions to each of these problems. Oh. Great message. Um, another question related to uh, the work of the foundation is um, this issue of building a better global governance system, 
Uh, and I see uh, that you also serve on the advisory board of the, the Open Societies uh, Foundation. Um, so a better global governance system, particularly the United Nations, uh, that can lead to a more, again, inclusive, just, sustainable world. Um, when you spoke uh, at that UN meeting uh, that um, uh, we invited you to, um, you, you spoke uh, about the UN's failure to address exclusion and discrimination in India, um, including very grievous human rights violations. Uh, and the, the, the usual that I saw in my own career as well, um, this reluctance to speak out uh, against uh, government failings or active uh, um, injustice toward certain segments of the population. Um, do you see that as um, a failure of uh, the existing global governance system? And, and how do you think global governance needs to be improved and corrected so that it can play an effective role in promoting uh, exclusion, fratern fraternity, uh, not promoting inclusion, combating uh, exclusion uh, and promoting fraternity, uh, and especially in big and powerful countries like India, uh, that uh, do have a lot of weight in international and global institutions like the, the UN. Yeah, that's. I think that that that's, that's again an uh, incredibly important question. Uh, I see uh, the UN, you know, as a collective, almost completely irrelevant in a country like India, mm -hmm. uh, and and the reasons, you know, I, I look hard for them, uh, is the amount of aid or assistance that they bring in is a tiny fraction of a fraction mm -hmm. of, of, of the union budget, for instance. In small, mm -hmm. very poor countries, the UN probably has more weight with the government because it brings in significant amounts of, of resources. Uh, so the UN, I think, uh, has to be reformed in, uh, in in, in, in its influence being in its moral voice mm -hmm. of, of corrective. So I find, you know, in my interaction with UN officials in India, they're desperate to have, a, you know, a, 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 a meeting with a junior uh, you know, government of India official and they think, you know, their task is done. Uh, and in order to get that little space, they will silence uh, all voices of disagreement and dissent. So I do believe that the UN uh, should probably be downsized com considerably and should really be a, a, a voice, or it, it should observe, uh, 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 you know, uh, and should have uh, the courage and the, the stake uh, to speak with clarity, uh, with restraint but, and with evidence but with clarity uh, about uh, what is going wrong. Through all of this, I mean, if you look at, you know, I talked about the collapse virtually, I mean, I, it's the crisis, the greatest crisis of, of, of the Indian Republic, uh, you know, breaking down of most democratic principles. I would find it hard to find a single UN document, uh, except some observations by the UN rapporteurs, uh, uh, which actually, say this loud and clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are times, I mean, even for myself, how much uh, the, the government may try to crush my voice I, I, and, and our work. I say that in times like this, uh, speaking the truth, uh, as somebody has said, is, is sometimes the most revolutionary of all acts. And it is this truth speaking uh, and uh, you know, with no stakes, uh, that I think the UN needs to do. Uh, even through the pandemic, I mean, I found the WHO's comments, uh, you know, doesn't have even uh, either scientific consistency. There seems to be juggling a number of interests, not offending certain governments, uh, upholding certain private uh, pharma companies' interests, and so on and so forth. Uh, we need to look at the UN as a, a, a reliable, independent 
global voice uh, for the values that we are speaking about. I don't know how idealistic that is, but I don't see a role for the UN in the way that it is functioning. It is truly quite irrelevant in, in, in a large, uh, powerful country like India in its present form. And I, I think I agree with you. Uh, one, that if the UN seeks its influence through the amount of financial or material aid that it provides, obviously it's, it's, it's irrelevant. And in fact, uh, when I was working in Bangkok, when I met you, we did an exercise of looking at the health budgets of uh, countries in our region, the Asia Pacific region, and even the Afghanistan Ministry of Health had more of a budget than all of uh, UNFPA where I worked. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I think my own experience tells me um, uh, in even in uh, relatively large and prosperous countries, for example, I, I had the opportunity to work in Mexico, which is like India, very nationalistic uh, country and not necessarily very tolerant of international organizations meddling in their affairs. Um, but um, the, the more open-minded of our counterparts would tell me, you know, um, we don't need your money because we've got money, we can pay for stuff, uh, but we need your legitimacy um, and we need your accompaniment uh, to do the right thing. Um, and I, I think that despite uh, uh, the lack of financial resources, it is after all the only institutions where all of the countries in the world are represented. Right. And, and our staff in the countries in, in um, do uh, in some way represent all of those countries. And, and I think that uh, that gives um, our people uh, more, much more of an authority than they uh, think they have, uh, if they were to dare to assume it. Uh, and you, you spoke about the WHO. Um, there was an article that I read, um, I think it was in The Guardian, about how it dealt with the SARS um, pandemic under Gro Harlem Brundtland, and, um, and how she assumed authority that others assumed that uh, others just thought that, well, WHO didn't have that kind of authority. She just took it upon herself to exercise it. And um, it did make a difference in terms of, for example, nudging China to, to share information that it was reluctant to do and so on. Um, so um, I, 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 I do agree with you on that. Yes. Yeah. No, if if you know, it, I, I've a clear voice for vaccine equity, for instance. I mean, mm -hmm. the WHO should have been in the leadership of at least shaming countries which have stockpiled uh, vaccines well beyond their populations, uh, and uh, and uh, many developing countries aren't even able to begin their vaccination. India has covered right. three percent of its population, etc. I think that uh, you know, how much the hubris and uh, arrogance of our government uh, do dissent. I do find that the only criticism that they're really sensitive to is international criticism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and the UN uh, must retain its moral voice uh, for its fairness. And there I must also say, uh, which may be uh, a difficult thing to say. I remember I was called to Holland to speak uh, as the keynote speaker in, 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 in this gathering where I said that, yes, there's a great deal wrong with uh, the injustice, the intolerance, etc. In, in my country, for instance. But so, so is there in Holland, what is, you know, what is the treatment of minorities, uh, you know, Muslim minorities, people of color uh, in uh, in European countries, in, in the United States, for instance. And uh, the criticism, I mean, I think another problem with the, uh, with the compromising, uh, compromise in the moral voice of, of, the, uh, of, of, of the UN agencies is, the, is how they use different standards, uh, you know, uh, with uh, what the United States does when it goes to war vis-a-vis -vis what uh, other countries are doing. Uh, 
you know, Israel and Palestine, is there a clear voice, etc. So I do believe that we need to aspire to, as I said, a much more downsized uh, non-field interventionist because it's always marginal. Uh, and to create those spaces for, for, for field intervention, there are a lot of compromises that you do with the government. Yeah. And uh, a clarity and a fairness in its assessment, which takes the United States and uh, India and China and uh, a small African country uh, using the same moral standards. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you, you spoke about how you grew up in a different India uh, mm -hmm. with, where different kinds of values prevailed than the, the, the current young generation. Um, do you think that's what, it, what makes you uh, engage in the kind of struggle that you are engaged in? Uh, or is there something else in your own life or in your upbringing that's, that's driven you to do what you do? What, what has made that difference? Hard to say, you know, this is often asked of me. Uh, uh, but let me say, you know, just autobiographically that my family uh, was affected by partition. Uh, my parents actually lived in that part of India uh, that is now in Pakistan, in Rawalpindi. And uh, they were uprooted. There was huge cruelty and violence and suffering in my large extended family. Uh, and, 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 and I'm truly grateful to my parents that uh, they never raised us with, with a sense of hatred of Muslims uh, because uh, of what Muslim mobs did to us uh, as a family and community. Uh, I'm born in a Sikh family. Uh, the truth is that actually, uh, uh, you know, about a million people died in Hindu Muslim violence, but the losses were almost equal among, you know, where Hindus and Sikhs were in a majority, they committed the same kind of violence and atrocities as Muslims committed uh, uh, against Hindus and Sikhs, where they were in a majority. But this partial remembering, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Muslims would talk only about the atrocities that they suffered, but not those that they inflicted. And likewise, with, 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 with what Hindus did, I, uh, I don't think we, you know, uh, I have great admiration, for instance, about how the German people have tried to deal with the legacy of, uh, of uh, Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, generation after generation. They've acknowledged uh, that the that the danger. I mean, the fact is that the large majority of uh, non-Jew uh, Germans, I mean, not only elected but adored Adolf Hitler. And he was not defeated by the German people, but but by Allied forces in in, in the uh, in the uh, in the Second World War. Uh, that there were very very few examples of resistance by non-Jews uh, on the streets uh, against what was happening to their Jewish sisters and brothers. I think there's a huge lesson uh, for us to learn, and I still can have hope in my country uh, and indeed the United States under Trump, where ordinary people came out in large numbers in solidarity uh, with the oppressed people. Uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, it was not only Black people, but also uh, you know, uh, people from the white community who came out. In India, uh, the changes in citizenship law, which uh, discriminated against Muslims for the first time, uh, so in universities across the country, uh, the largest upsurge of nonviolent protests with huge numbers of non-Muslim young people uh, standing, you know, and some of the slogans were really beautiful. I remember one which said, you divide, we multiply. And I think that, you know, those four words summarized uh, how, how we have to resist. So this idea of, uh, of, uh, of a common future and injustice to any one of the people in my country and of course in the world uh, is injustice to me and I will fight it even if I'm actually a beneficiary of this system of injustice uh, is something that we'll have to work on very, very, very much. Neoliberalism, I think, uh, 
And when I see the changes in, in India uh, among young people, uh, this is the neoliberal generation, but this is also the generation which has grown up where there has been such a normalization and in fact, valorization of hatred and bigotry against Muslims. You know, all of us are, you know, almost every one of us talk about WhatsApp family groups and groups of friends and school and college students. And you're amazed at the extent of bigotry against Muslims, for instance, that is freely pervade. Uh, and it is, you know, I'm sure there were people who were bigoted when I was growing up, but they were embarrassed about articulating their bigotry. Uh, today, it is the opposite, actually. Uh, the person who is speaking for love and uh, fraternity and harmony is the one who is, you know, in, you know has to speak out and is, uh, is uh, almost persecuted and excluded uh, in, these, in the popular discourse. So I think it's a, it's a, you know, they've been fighting for a hundred years to, 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 to build a, a different kind of India. And uh, we have to see this as a generational battle uh, in India and the world. Um, there was a very, uh, very fine, I mean, not known outside India, uh, very fine Muslim leader of, uh, of the Indian National Congress during the freedom struggle called Monana Azad who was completely opposed to the idea of a separate Muslim nation, saying India belongs equally to its Muslims. And at one place, he said that, suppose, uh, you know, Angel Gabriel comes uh, on top of Kutub Minar, which is this very, and uh, says that you have a choice between freedom and uh, Hindu-Muslim unity. Uh, what would you choose? And then he replies that I would choose Hindu-Muslim unity because if freedom is delayed for the Indian people would suffer. But if the idea of Hindu-Muslim unity collapses, then humankind will suffer because yeah. we will demonstrate that it is not possible for people of difference to live together with respect. I, I find that such a profound thought about our responsibility uh, as the Indian people. We are the most diverse country in the world, civilizationally. If we show that we cannot live together peacefully, then what example are we setting to the world? No, I, I, I think that's a, a really important point and I, I agree with you completely. And, and um, the, the, the times that I went to India where I, I really didn't see very much, but um, even with all of the issues that you mentioned, right. um, I was still struck by just the wonder of a country of that size and diversity still managing to maintain uh, a democracy. Uh, and, and I think that is uh, a symbol of hope for the world. And, and it is really, really important to, to, yes. Yes. Um, to fight for that. And uh, I, I really wish you strength and, and success uh, in that effort. Thank you so much, Yuko. It was a pleasure to talk uh, with you uh, about uh, matters actually closest to my heart, uh, not just for the Indian people, but for the people of the world, uh, that we must the new, uh, you know, enable the young generation uh, to leave the world in a much better shape than people of your and my generation have. have right. been. <laughs> Thank you so much, Harsh. And then I hope that we can stay in touch in That's some true. way. And, and yeah, Thank and you. hopefully, yeah, meet in person one of these days. <laughs>